Hi, welcome to my class today. Um, my name is Judy Corey, and today we will be talking about brainstorming and outlining a best-selling romance novel. Um, this is a topic that I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out. When I first wrote my, um, like my first couple of books, I kind of wrote on instinct, and that ended up taking a long, long time. Um, just trying to figure out how to put a romance novel together and get all of the different parts that readers expect and are hoping to get when they are reading a book. Um, and so I spent quite a while after that trying to just really figure out the romance beat and just all the different things that you need to know up front so that I could make the writing process a lot faster. Um, and so, I am here to just uh, give you all the information that I learned and found helpful. And um, another thing is, uh, this is specific to romance because romance, writing a romance novel, it's like a, a whole animal of its own. I have been to lots of classes on outlining where um, it was directed more towards the other genres of books where romance really is just, it has its own set of different things that make it separate and special. And so we're just going to be talking about those today and I hope you find those helpful. So um, since I am not super high tech, you can see all of these lovely little thumbnails of my slides because I don't know how to actually show myself and the um, PowerPoint while it's in the whole, the official playing zone, so just don't pay too much attention to that. Um, anyway, okay, so here we go. So you want to write a book. If you are lucky, you already know what book you want to write. You can't stop thinking about it. It basically writes itself. Um, you can see the beginning all the way to the end, and you can use it to explain what it's about to others. If you're one of those people, you are lucky. <laughs> um, that doesn't always happen. And so sometimes I do have books that are like that and I love them for it. It makes my life so much easier when I have an idea and it just works out. Um, but that is not always the case. So that is when these brainstorming and outlining techniques come in handy for me. Okay, so you don't already have a big idea? Let's just start here. So first you want to pick a genre to write in. Every genre has its own different flavors and different things that readers expect to find in the story. And so you really need to be familiar with the genre you're writing in so that you can give the readers what they want and really create a really good um, story. So being familiar with the genre is going to make it so much easier to write. You'll already know the reader expectations and just have a great idea of what makes a good story in that genre. So to do that, you of course want to read and listen to, read or listen, I guess, um, to a lot of books in that genre to get the ideas flowing. That really helps me every time I finish a book and I'm gearing up to write another book, I take some downtime a lot of time to you know recuperate because <laughs> writing a book can be intense sometimes, especially when you're on a deadline. But also, um, I, I use that time to just get the re refill my creative tank and get the ideas flowing, and um, also see what is selling really well. I I will find books that are on the Amazon top 100s of my genre, um, those lists, and just really dig in and find out what is doing well and what readers are loving at that moment in time. Um, also just books that have sold well for a long time because not not every book in the top of the top 100 is going to stay there for very long. So um, just really find really good books to read. Um, also, watching movies or TV shows in my genre, that helps me a lot. I like to listen to new music to come up with ideas. That helps me get into, just experience new feelings and come up with new ideas from that. And then also going to 
um, the tropes list can help me come up with um, different tropes that I want to work with in that specific book. Um, and tropes, they really help me set everything up and it gives me built-in conflict and really gets the ideas flowing with possibilities. So if you write romance, which um, a lot of us do in the writing gals, the um, a great place to go, I have a daughter knocking on my door right now, so that's exciting. Um, okay, so yeah, let me go to where I go a lot of the time to find those tropes. It's really handy. Um, here it is. Okay, so it is on the Writing Gals website. And this is Victorine's trope list. She was awesome and uh, wrote this book right here, you can see. And in it, she put a list of tropes and she was kind enough to put it on our Writing Gals website, which is thewritinggals.com. Um, and you can find it under the author help pages. Anyway, so since I write romance, I go through these different tropes and just kind of decide which ones are speaking to me at the moment. And I like to find so, like one like really big trope at least, and then a couple other smaller tropes to mix in and just make the story exciting and a little different because not all readers are going to be super into the main trope, but if you can show in the blurb or the tagline that there is another trope that they may like, then they are more likely to download your book and read it and love it and share it with everyone. Um, so yeah, these are these are the tropes. And so, and I'll sometimes try to figure out a way to mix them in ways that I haven't seen done before that are exciting to me. Um, and then another thing that I have done is I have actually, like for my upcoming series that I'm going to be writing, since I want to write a best-selling novel and I want to give my readers something that they love, I actually pulled my newsletter um, for what asking them which tropes they would like to see from me. And so I just created a, a poll uh, in a Google Forms thing and just wrote them all out and had them check all the different tropes that they wanted. And I was able to see which ones were their favorites, which tells me um, which books, like, because the, the, the series will have several books. So like one book will have the main trope be the number one voted on trope. And then my second book will go on the second most favorite trope. And then I'll mix in some of my other favorites that maybe didn't get as many votes, but that I still really want to write in with those. Um, so that was really helpful. Just get give me ideas of what to do. So you can definitely do that. If you don't have a big newsletter or you're just getting started, you can, um, again, look at the well, first find out which tropes you really like and then look at what's selling these days or you can do a Facebook poll or just any, whatever. Okay, let me get back to my thing. Okay. Okay, so you're starting to get ideas. Okay, and then next you're going to want to pick your theme. You don't always have to pick it first, but it can be helpful just to give you an idea of what what the book will will teach, um, because the best books do not only entertain, but they also teach something, and the readers come away feeling like they um, they've learned something different or reaffirmed something that's important to them. So, your theme is uh, like a truth that you want to shout from the rooftops to the world. This. Um, is something that maybe you have experienced in your life and learned because our characters, if we're doing it right, they will have a character arc. They may start out not knowing something or having a misconception. And then over the course of the novel, they will come to realize that they had been wrong about something and they'll grow and become a new version of themselves that's better and in a better place to go forward with their happily ever after since we write happily ever afters in romance. 
So what is the big idea that you want to teach your readers, of course, in a non-preachy way? If you are too heavy handed, they won't like it. Um, some examples of themes, some that I've used and others that I have seen done are um, the opposites attract. Um, compromise is necessary for a strong relationship. To be grown up means taking responsibility for your life. You must not be afraid to reach for an impossible dream. There's no place like home. Good triumphs over evil. Love triumphs over fear. You can't take responsibility for anyone's life but your own. A family doesn't have to be related through blood. Home is where you make it. Money can't buy happiness. True intimacy must include complete trust. Love can tame a beast. You must learn to accept your lover as they are. You're not the, your biggest mistake. Forgiveness can bring you your greatest happiness. It's okay to do what is best for you in your life. You're stronger than you think. Taking risks might be scary, but are worth it. You are enough. Don't judge people because you don't know what they're going through. Um, every villain is the hero of his own story. You are valuable. Not everyone changes, but some people do. Snap judgments are not always correct. You must let go of the past before you can move forward. Love is better the second time around. Love can triumph over unfortunate circumstances. So they're just some examples of themes um, to get your um, creative juices going, or you can even use those if any of them speak to you. Okay. So now that you've got your theme, you need to create your characters. They, I write character-driven novels, and so those will drive my plot and really make the story. So you want to get the characters and just all their baggage because they're not perfect, and um, they're you know they're like humans, they're not humans because of course they're imaginary, but I like to pretend like they're real. Um, okay, so what are your characters' names? How do they relate to the story? Um, in uh, romance, you definitely want to have the the two love interests in there. Um, what are their ages? Physical description. What do they like? What do they hate? Some um, I've seen lists where you can just like like questionnaires online. You can look up and just fill out about your characters to really kind of get, get to know them better. So really, just dig into the characters. Okay, so every character needs the following things. They need a desire. So they need the thing that they want and think that will make them happy. Mm -hmm. They also need to have a fear, which is the thing that is stopping them from going after their desire. And then they also need a misbelief, which is the thing that they mistakenly believe is true about the world which is the opposite of the theme. So what ha and then also try to, you know, get into their backstory and try to figure out what happened in their past to make them believe this misbelief. So readers are looking for an internal journey leading to an aha moment that will put the death that will put to death the misbelief that your protagonist has held onto their whole life. So give them these things and then over the course of the novel, you will show them they were wrong, basically, <laughs> at least with some of those. Okay, other things to remember when creating your characters are, is character's inner goal will need to drive her external goal, and that will lay the foundation for the plot. So, um, yeah, so if you can bring the hero and heroine's goals into conflict, you have a good chance of creating believable tension that will keep your readers engaged. In romance, when your two main characters are trying to reach their goals, their competing goals must be of similar importance. Make sure your readers care about both of them succeeding. And the stakes need to be high. If they don't reach their goals, something bad will happen, or at least it seems bad to the characters. So um, like external goals are like example, like they want to make partner at their law firm or they want to um, become a famous actress or they want just things out, like external, want like to maybe give them a better quality of life a lot of the times or they just want to 
move out of their parents' home and get on their own or whatever. Um, inner goals are they want to find love they or they don't want to find love. They want just anything that any types of goals that come from inside. Okay, some more things to remember. You you don't want to have perfect characters, but you also don't want to have really like dumb characters that people don't want to root for that mess up everything. So you want to make them really competent, just not competent in what they need for the story. That will make it exciting and fun and entertaining to read. So, um, and then no matter how bad things get for your character, there still needs to be moments of light. So a lot of times I, I write books that deal with heavier issues, um, like the teen pregnancy, teen homelessness, divorce, um, just, you know, heavier, heavier things that, that people do deal with. And, um, but you, you don't want to have it all be doom and gloom the whole time because this is a romance and people read it to escape from the world a lot of the time. And so even though you deal with heavier subjects sometimes, you'd want to make sure that there are also fun scenes and um, just things that can make your characters laugh. Um, okay, and then characters should have big insecurities at the beginning of the book that are only tested more as the story continues. So yeah, we, um, Basically, you know, you put a character up in the tree and then you throw rocks at them and then you take them out at the end. So it's, it's uh, those poor characters, but makes for great stories. Okay, and then a character's story comes from their choices. So this is the ability, this ability to make decisions that change the direction of the plot is called character agency. And characters with proper agency will write their own stories and they will do it faster, better, and more naturally than you or I ever could do. So, um, but though sometimes this can be really frustrating because you can outline all you want and brainstorm everything. But if you've written really good characters, sometimes they will take over and you have to either follow along or rein them in um, or yeah, be okay with changing things sometimes. Okay, so making both the heroine and hero protagonists and giving them a strong antagonistic force to defeat together not only allows for that fight to the death ending, but it fosters the relationship because people who struggle together against a common enemy in pursuit of a common goal form a strong emotional bond. So that's something um, else you can keep in mind when creating your story. Having them, especially in like the enemies to lovers tropes, they wouldn't necessarily want to be together, but forcing them to work closely with each other against something can really let them see the good in each other and fall in love. Okay, so another thing to do is to describe the vibe of your story. What three words would you use to describe the feeling of your story? Is it mysterious, thrilling, swoonworthy? Don't know if that's two words or one, but whatever. Um, Cute, sad, happy, hilarious, heartwarming, dreamy, and etc. Just really think about what words you would use to describe the mood or the emotions that you want your readers to feel while reading your story. And this can give you a good idea of different elements to bring in different scenes that you can create that, that will create those feelings in your readers. Okay, then you wanna pick a location. So what kind of location best fits the vibe that you want your story to have? Is it going to be in a contemporary small town? Will it be at a beach resort? Is it going to be in a, at a, a different time period in a historical setting or a completely different world? Or is it going to be in a big city, like a small city where it's at a school? Um, if you're writing young adult, a lot of those happen at academies or um, so just really pick the a location and, um, and, and books can have, of course, several different locations. So you might want to choose 
several different places that you want to spend your time in. Okay, other things that can help in the brainstorming process are making Pinterest aesthetics boards for your story. You can, um, you can, you know, pin different settings that you want to have, pin photos of your, of people you imagine being your characters, um, just all, whatever helps. Listen to new music. That always helps me listening to new songs and trying to find new songs because I, you know, the ones that I've already listened to go with other books. So I need new songs to make a new book. Um, and then also make a playlist for your story. This, I do this with every book now because it just really helps me get right into where I need to be when I'm going to be writing. Or if I'm needing to brainstorm some more as I'm writing, I can listen to the songs and, and, um, and remember different scenes that I'd wanted to make, or just really, it gets, helps me think about my book a little more. Um, and then give your book a working title and ask yourself, what is this, what is a story that you want to read? Because we are our first audience and we want to, in, if we, if we're not enjoying the book, it's likely other people aren't enjoying it. So we want to make sure that it is something we would want to read. Okay, so now that you've got a lot of great ideas, it's time to make sense of it all. This is always, I always love it when I'm finally ready to kind of like, I've, I've got all these ideas and um, it's time to put them together. Okay, so in your mats we have beats and um, they help the flow of the story and, and if done right, it, It'll just be the perfect romance, you know. Of course, art is never perfect, but having these in the right spots and done well can really create a great experience for your readers. So first, you want to have the setup or the hook. So this is the opening scene or sequence of the story. Where do you want your characters to start out? And what is the first thing that we're going to see them? I always uh, like to kind of start because I, I do it. The romance. I always like to start with like a funny scene or something embarrassing happens a lot of the time and um, just really get into the story in a fun way. Um, this is also a way to create empathy for the characters by showing what they lack. Uh, it shows it's the what's wrong with this picture and it show and you want to show the characters inner and outer goals at this point. So, um, since so it's always helpful to to kind of see it done also, I put, we're going to use Pride and Prejudice as an example. A lot of people are familiar with it. It's uh, like the best, you know, well-known romance of all time. So, in the setup or hook in Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth and the sisters are single. So, of course, they are going to be in want of a man, and we know that... Elizabeth is the main character and that a romance is likely on the horizon because they are all single. Okay, next is the meet or the inciting incident. So the inciting incident brings the two love interests together and into conflict. An inventive but credible contrivance, often amusing, which in some ways sets the tone for the action to come. So Give some in, this can give some insight into how perfect the characters could be for each other, but they're not ready yet. They meet, you can have it be funny, embarrassing, serious, maybe they hate each other. Um, so just however they meet, you want the, the love interest to come together. And so in Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth meet and they hate each other. So that's exciting. That's conflict right there at the beginning. Okay, and then you want to figure out what the turning point of your novel can be. So the traditionally, this occurs at the end of Act 1, and this is, so in the external relationship arc, you need to figure out what happens that forces the characters to spend time together, because if they're not spending time together, how can they fall in love? And the best romances, in my opinion, are when the, the hero and the heroine are, like, almost in every scene together. That really helps the romance. 
And so you want to figure out how to get them to be together. Uh, internal relationship arc. What decision do the characters make that reflects their desire for each other? And they don't even have to fully acknowledge that they like each other. A lot of times they want to be, they're fighting. They're like, no, I will not fall in love. And, um, but show, even though they may not realize it, that the, the chance of love between them is very likely. So in Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy breaks up Jane and Mr. Bingley and proposes to Elizabeth in a very insulting way. So, um, that this, they, this just kind of shows that, oh, Mr. Darcy does have feelings for her and it just surprised her. And so it kind of sets them on this, it just changed things for the story. Okay, next is the midpoint or the raising of the stakes. So, and the midpoint, it doesn't necessarily have to happen right at the 50% mark of your book. It doesn't have to happen right in the middle, but it's like the, um, it's, it takes them from where where the character, like like the middle of the character arc, basically. Um, they're in between their single and unhappy or and then they're happily ever after so it's like the middle of that so this is a situation that irrevo irrevocably binds sorry i learned how to say words by reading them so if i pronounce them wrong sorry about that okay a situation that irrevocably binds the protagonist with the antagonist which is the love interest um, often while tweaking sexual tensions and has further implications for the outcome of the relationship. So in romance, the midpoint can be where the protagonist stops running away from the love interest and realizes that she wants him. Then she starts to chase after the goal of getting him. And this is where I usually try to have a, a first kiss between the characters. And, or if you write steamy romance, you may have a sex scene at this point as well. So. I, like with this this first kissing scene, it's not as passionate or they don't know exactly how they feel at that point. Um, but the kiss can be used to help them realize that they might have feelings for the other person and they might want to try to see if something can happen. Okay, and so... In Pride and Prejudice, the midpoint is where Mr. Darcy explains himself in a letter. He is a nobleman trying to protect his friend from perceived impropriety. So um, we see that he, even though he's messed up a lot, he did it for good reasons. He just, you know, messed up a little. Okay, so the next beat is the swivel, which is, the, or the second turning point. So this traditionally occurs at the end of act two. The characters make some sort of commitment to each other, but there is still something waiting in the wings to pull them apart because we are not at the end and they cannot be fully happy until the very end of the story or else your characters or your readers will get bored. So this is where I usually have a really good kissing scene where they're finally letting down their walls and letting the others in and being more allowing themselves to be more vulnerable. Um, it's what you've been building towards since the hook in the first chapter. And things are so good between them, they are almost meant to be. So this is um, just everything is ramped up really high. It looks like they are going to get there happily ever after. But there are still some things in the character arc that need to be resolved. They still have a little bit of fear. There's still something waiting to mess things up. But for now, they're happy and they they think that it's going to be great for the most part. But of course, the dark moment or the crisis has to happen. And so just when it looks like the couple is going to finally come together, it all falls apart. There can be a secret that's revealed that um, one of the characters has been keeping from the other. Um, some antagonistic force breaks them apart. They self-sabotage. They 
Um, just something triggers the character's fear about the relationship and everything that they've built together is seemingly lost forever. Um, and at this point, it will appear as if things can't get any worse because, you know, they just lost their chance at love, their one shot with their perfect soulmate, and it's just not going to be able to happen for them. And um, this will be the climax of your character's inner arc as she rounds the corner of the lie she's been fighting through the book and finally comes face to face with the truth. And it is a hard truth. Otherwise, it wouldn't have taken an entire story to recognize. And her need to embrace it will make this plot point all the more difficult, even though it's for her own good. So they thought they had it, but they are not going to be together. It's lost. They're broken apart. And, and this can be, um, I've had books where it, like the dark moment lasts for several chapters and others where it is resolved much quicker than that. So it just depends on your story and what is, you know, what these characters need and just how big of a, a difficulty they needed to overcome. So in Pride and Prejudice, this is when Lydia runs off with Mr. Wickham and, and Elizabeth thinks that Darcy will hate her family even more because they are so embarrassing to her and just not as proper as Mr. Darcy deserves to be. You know, why would he want to be with a family like that? Okay, so you have made your characters really miserable. I'm really bad and that's like one of my favorite things to do because I know that the more miserable they are, the more rewarding their happily ever after will be. So you've got them really sad. This is where they need to figure things out and fix the thing that's, that's breaking them apart. And so this is the moment that will make or break her. Will she rise up again and conquer or will she fall deeper still and end in a tragic negative arc? Hopefully they will rise. Um, so your character will have spent the this eighth of the story reeling, questioning all her choices, questioning her commitment to her story goal, questioning her questioning her own self worth and ability, and then she will have her aha moment where she realizes that she has believed a lie this whole time, which is your theme. So if there was like so in one of my books that this um, I guess one of the secrets that was being held was this guy was this actually this girl's bodyguard the whole time. She thought he was just this new guy and they were friends and then they, you know, fell in love. She had no idea he was keeping a secret. And so, and so he believed that, you know, she would never be able to forgive him, but that was a lie because um, as we saw in, um, in the examples of themes, is that, oh, well, taking risks might be scary, but are worth it. That kind of goes with it. Um, there was another one I can't think of. Darn it. Um, anyway, but yeah, so you can overcome those things. Okay, let me get back. Oh, okay. So um, in... Pride and Prejudice, this is where Lady Catherine de Burr comes to speak to Elizabeth to reassure her that the rumors about Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth are false. Um, of course, Elizabeth doesn't uh, reassure her at all because she realizes that, or she learns that Mr. Darcy actually helped Lydia escape from Mr. Wickham, and she realizes that she's in love with Mr. Darcy, and so she... Um, she won't tell Lady Catherine de Burr that she, she doesn't have feelings for Darcy and that they are in fact perfect for each other. Okay, so then you have the lovely climax and resolution what you've been working towards the whole book. 
So characters will come back together and realize that their love is worth any sacrifice it takes to be together. Um, oftentimes I'll have a kissing scene here. It's not always the most passionate one of the whole story. Sometimes it is. Um, it just depends on your story and your characters. And if you write a uh, steamy, you can have a sex scene here. And um, this is also where the I love you's can be exchanged and the characters move towards their happy ending. So in Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy comes to Elizabeth's home and he proposes to her and Elizabeth accepts and they are destined to live happily ever after. Isn't that just great? Because we all want our happily ever after. Okay, so now that you have figured out the different story beats for your story, there are some other things that can really help the writing process go smoothly and help you write that story faster. Um, so you can make a timeline where you line up the events of the novel. Um, you also write down the ages of the characters, how long everyone's known each other. You can draw a map, especially if you are creating your own world and if it's a fantasy romance. You, or even if you're like, I write contemporary, but I make up cities a lot of the time because I wanna um, just focus, you know, on, on the series in that, in that city. And so you can even draw a map for, for contemporary worlds as well. Um, you can write out who knows what and when, um, memorize everyone's particulars or at least have them handy. Um, if you write fantasy, you might have some tricky name spellings. So you might wanna really memorize those or I've heard that people just put like placeholders in their document and then later do a search and replace or whatever. So get the name spellings right, physical descriptions down so they're not always looking. What color of eyes did he have? What color of hair did she have? Um, and then get the ages for the major cast, important places and the relative distances, if they, like especially if they're traveling. Okay, um, other things, write out a scene list. This is like one of my favorite things to do because it's like, um, it's kind of like writing the story but in a mini version and you really get to just figure out all the different scenes that you want. And so I basically just write out all the candy bar scenes that I'm most excited about and then find a way to weave all those scenes together into a story. So by candy bar scenes, that's a term that comes from um, Rachel Aaron in her book, 2K to 10K, that's not the official title, but um, something like that. And um, it's just, you want, you kind of want every scene to be a candy bar scene mm -hmm. because you want to be excited to write every scene of your book and you want your readers to not be able to put the book down. And so, um, just having candy bar scenes and then just little bridges in between them if you need. Um, and that'll make a great, exciting story. Um, you can write a mini synopsis for each chapter. So so what I usually do is I'll just, um, I'll just write, you know, what the scene idea is and then just go kind of go through what, what it does and then just do that through the whole book. And of course, none of this is necessary. Some people are pantsers and they love to just get the basic things down and then go from there. Um, but this has helped me um, get a word count estimation and um, so most like full length novels, at least what's accepted now, um, minimum of around 50,000 words. Mine are usually 75,000 words because I add extra things into it to make a, a bigger story. Um, so just figure out what kind of story you want to tell. If you're telling a novella, that can be much lower. So just do that. And then do a boredom check. Um, as you're writing, if you get bored, you might want to just, you know, switch things up again. Might need to do a little more brainstorming to excite your mind again. Um, go through each scene in your head to check for any possible boredom spots. Um, and then, because we need to be excited about everything we write, because this will make the reader excited to read every scene. 
Okay, and then you start writing. Don't be afraid to let go and just write. Um, this is something I have had to learn because I can, I really love outlining and brainstorming. It's really fun. It's, um, it's exciting. Everything's new and shiny. And it's easier for me to outline than it is to actually write. I'm one of those people who actually prefers editing. And so getting started is like the hardest part for me. So, but sometimes, you know, you can brainstorm all you want, but you won't actually get a full view of the story until you're you're writing it. I learned so many more things than I um, than I knew before when when I actually get into the characters heads and start writing. Um, okay, so and then just because you have made a decision as you outlined and brainstormed, it doesn't mean that you can't make a better one later in the story. So don't get too to attach to all the ideas that you had at the beginning. I have had the um, the problem of, of doing that in the past and it really slowed me down because I would try to make a story fit with a certain idea that I had and then I've eventually just had to realize that I needed to be willing to change things in the story and it usually ends up much better because like I said at the beginning, if you have those characters done right, then they will write the story themselves a lot of the times. So be okay to let them take over. And then um, when you get stuck, just ask how did this happen? And then you, you can work backwards from there to see if you need to tweak some things. And then, um, but also it just, what you have already written, may, this happens to me a lot. I, I thought that I knew where the story was going. I write something else. My characters surprise me in some way. And, and now suddenly I'm stuck because what I have already written doesn't fit with what I had outlined and brainstormed before. And I can't just mush them together like I want to sometimes. And so either figure out if something went wrong, if you really do have to do what's coming next and then go back and fix that. Or sometimes I will just re-outline from, from where, wherever I got stuck. And I can, I don't do a full on outline all the time, but I might have to outline the next couple scenes or chapters to get going again and get back on track. Okay. And so when a plot won't move forward, it's almost always because there's something I don't know about the characters or a world or why this event is actually happening. So maybe, like I was saying, maybe instead of changing what you've already written, you could consider altering what you had planned. Don't be afraid to take the inspiration that comes as you write. You won't have all of your best ideas at the beginning of the story. Okay. Um, so this, seven ways to create conflict in your novel. This is something that I always need a little extra help with. Um, like just barely in the book that I am drafting, I outlined it, I brainstormed, I thought I had everything all figured out that I needed to know. And so then I got started writing because I, I, I know that, that even as I write more, I will figure it out and, um, and the a lot of inspiration comes from that. So I had started writing, I got to like chapter four and I realized that I had like hardly any conflict or not enough. It was like, well, it's time that these characters can just get married now. It's fine. There's no, nothing really keeping them apart. It's obvious that they, they, this will work out. And so I needed to figure out even more ways to add conflict into my story and figure out some some things that could keep them apart for you know seventy five thousand words, um, and so if you need help with that, here are some ideas. So you can force a character to face a fear. So consider what your protagonist is afraid of and what she might never ever think of doing if it involved that fear. Then look for ways to make her do it. Because we love to torture these characters. 
um, offer an impossible choice. That's another idea. So when there's no clear answer and both choices have terrible consequences, readers know something about the story is going to change and make the stakes go up. Two solid ways to keep readers hooked. So you might have to force your character to make, so, so try, I guess, um, try to think of how might you force your character to make an impossible choice. Another way to add conflict is to make someone go against their beliefs. This can be a big thing. This can cause all kinds of emotions to happen and all kinds of crazy things to happen in the story. Another thing, um, have them keep secrets. So distrust and uncertainty make a character second guess everything she does, which can lead to mistakes and bad judgment. Even more fun is a character who has a secret and is actively working against the protagonist, even if no one but the author knows it. Um, and then think about what your protagonist doesn't know or might be holding back. Think about what your protagonist doesn't know or who might be holding back valuable information. Obviously, I have a few typos in my uh, PowerPoint. It is summer, my kids are home, and uh, life is exciting, so I don't have to fix those. Okay, um, five, have your character have bad days. Look for ways to heap small annoyances onto your protagonist so that when she needs a clear head to make critical decisions, she doesn't have one. Another one, you can allow disagreements. Give your second char secondary characters their own strong opinions and let them butt heads with the protagonist. Um, another one, let them get emotional. The more personal the obstacle in the protagonist's way, the more likely the reader will care about the outcome of that struggle. So just make their lives hard and it'll be great. Okay, so some last thoughts. Always ask yourself, what does my protagonist want in the overall story? Because um, that will help drive the plot. And then you can narrow that down. What does he or she want in this specific scene? Because they want they need to have goals in ev as just like when you have goals for the whole story, every scene should have a, a, a small goal and a reason for being there. And then what is your character doing to try to achieve it? And they don't always have to accomplish their goals. Um, in fact, a lot of times they will fail and that's good. You want them to fail because they have to fail to learn and then once they have learned, they can, you know, succeed. So just remember that plotting exists to make your life easier, not harder. It's to lift you up and not hold you back. And so if you find yourself outlining too much, you might have to, you know, stop. And if it's just not working for you, that is okay. Not everyone likes to outline their books. Some of the best books are just, you know, at the seat of the pants. They just come. So if that's what works for you, go ahead and let that work for you. I'm finding more and more that pantsing is great. Um, I like to have the story beats and um, at least ideas for them before I start writing. But I don't always have to go through scene by scene and figure out every little thing that is going to happen in the novel. So it's up to you how much you want to, to do before the actual drafting. Just do what works best for you. This is just a tool. And um, just remember that writing is not a performance art. And so don't be afraid to let everything be a total broken mess for a while if that's what it takes to get the story right. Um, that's what revision is for. That's what beta readers are for. They help you figure things out, critique partners. Um, just be okay to get that first draft because that in itself is a big accomplishment. And just getting that first thing down can really help you mold it into something you're really proud of and that your readers will love and read and just shout about to all their friends. So... Yeah. Um, 
So that is basically it for my class. I hope that that has been helpful for you. And uh, yeah, good luck writing your best-selling romance novel. Can't wait to read it.